Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. Good morning, friends. Ruth Ann Zimmerman here for Homesteading with the Zimmermans. In today's video, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we do with all the milk that we bring to the house. Now that our Jersey cow, Brenda, has had a calf um, and we're back to milking two cows, Brenda gets milked twice a day right now. Norma just gets milked once a day, but we are bringing between six and eight gallons of milk to the house each day. That means between 40 and 50 gallons a week. So uh, when we are in this stage of our milk cows every day, I have to say, what am I going to do with milk today? Because every day I have to do something with milk, um, whether that's make cheese or make something else with milk or run it through the separator and collect all the cream and give the skim milk to the pigs. Um, so in today's video, I'm going to be showing you a couple things that we do that use up a lot of milk. One of them is a farmhouse cheddar cheese and protein pudding cups. And I'm going to show you a little bit how our separator works and how we make butter. And I'll also link all of the other videos with milk resources or things that we do with milk in the description. Um, in addition to utilizing all the milk ourselves, um, we also have friends and neighbors that will come and get some milk from us. Um, so that takes up about five to eight gallons a week is what we share with friends and neighbors. But that still le leaves us with a lot of milk to use as a family. Good job. So this morning we are going to sanitize everything and strain our milk and then we're going to run it through the cream separator. And we use peroxide to sanitize rather than bleach and I'm going to link the video in the description. 
I'm going to link the video where I talk some more about the reasons we use peroxide instead of bleach. This cream separator is a Slavic beauty brand and I'm going to link their page in the description. It's a family owned business and we are working on nailing down a date to do a giveaway with this cream separator. Um, but today I'm going to give you a brief rundown of how it works and then when we do the actual giveaway I'll be much more um, in depth with how it works. But basically it has the these little cones that go inside this silver thing and it has an adjuster where you can adjust it to either get more cream or less cream you know how hard do you want to skim your milk So the cream separator works best when you run warm milk through it. So to begin with, I'm going to put some warm water in and we're going to keep the plug closed until the motor is up to speed. And then we're going to open, we're going to turn that and open the plug so that the water can start coming through. And when the water all comes out to where the skim milk comes out, we know it's put together and working properly and we can start adding our milk. You can see the skim milk coming out here on the left and the cream is coming out here on the right. So today's skim milk is all going to our pigs to help fatten them and cut down on our feed costs this month. But one of my favorite things to do with the skim milk is to make Parmesan with it. But today it's just going to the pigs. Using the cream separator in the morning takes just a little more time than straining the milk and putting it in the refrigerator, but in the long run, it saves me a lot more time and energy because normally if I wanna collect the cream from my milk, I need to strain the milk and put it in the refrigerator and leave it there for 24 to 48 hours and then skim the milk. And then I have got you know the jars to wash and I get more cream using my separator. Like I can skim it harder using the separator. So in the long run, I do feel like the cream separator saves me time. So today is another morning and that means it's another four gallons of milk. And today we are going to put our strained milk straight into a sanitized cheese pot and we are going to make some farmhouse cheddar. 
Today we are only using two of the gallons to make cheddar um, because that recipe is a little more manageable for those of you that want to make farmhouse cheddar. And the other two gallons we will use to make chocolate milk or just to drink it fresh. And I also want to make some pudding cups for the children. So I'm going to begin my cheese making process by sanitizing some of my tools that I know I need to use right off the bat, um, beginning with my thermometer and a container to rest all my tools in. So I set my cheese pot on a burner that was still warm from the cast iron that we used to make breakfast and it heated over 90 degrees. Um, so I have to set my cheese pot into the refrigerator and let it cool back down to 90 degrees. So in the meantime, I'm going to take all the cream that we separated yesterday and put that into my butter churn. So whenever I have milk that has already chilled, um, instead of heating it and running it through my cream separator, I would just use the old fashioned way of skimming milk, skimming the cream from the milk by using a ladle. I wet my ladle so the cream doesn't stick to it and then I just push it under the surface of the cream and let it fill up and that is Normally the way I skim my cream from chilled milk. So the reason that we sanitize everything for cheese making is because cheese making is really just a battle of the bacteria. And when we make aged cheeses, Especially when we make aged cheeses, do we want to sanitize everything? When you're making cheeses that don't need to be aged, it's not quite as important. <clears throat> but in this case, we're making a farmhouse cheddar which we're going to age and we want our chosen bacteria, which is the mesophilic culture, we want that bacteria to be the abundant bacteria and not any other bacteria that may have fallen into the milk while we were in the barn. Okay, so I've sanitized my spoon and I'm gonna put it in this sanitized container. And my milk is at 90 degrees, so we're ready to add our culture. Oh, this is the mesophilic culture and I get this from Azure. Um, some people use like clabber culture. I have tried the clabber culture and haven't had great success. Um, so I've gone back to using my bought cultures. So this is a mesophilic culture and the difference between mesophilic cultures and thermophilic cultures is the thermo is for high temperature cheeses and the meso is for low temperature cheeses. The farmhouse cheddar is a low temperature cheese. Um, so we're using one packet per two gallons and we're going to sprinkle this all over the top and then we're just going to give it a minute or two to kind of rehydrate because this is dehydrated culture and then we'll stir it all in. So I'm going to remove this just for a minute and we're going to stir in our culture. So it's a rainy day today and Normally, I don't make cheese on a rainy day because for the simple reason that it feels like a gamble to me when I make cheese on a rainy day and no, it's not some superstition. Here's the reason. When it rains, the cows are usually wet and then there's water that runs down off the cows and it's hard to keep those droplets from going into your milk bucket. So there's always a bigger risk that, you know, dirt from the cows ran in raindrops down into your bucket. 
So there's just a higher risk of bacteria on rainy days. So I am gambling a little bit with this farmhouse cheddar today. So when you add your culture, you want to make sure and stir for a good minute. You want to get that culture in every area of the milk. <clears throat> and you want to stir with kind of a downward motion like this to make sure that that culture is getting to the very bottom of your milk pot. So now that we've stirred it in well, we're just going to put the lid on and we're going to let it set for 45 minutes to an hour. So now that our milk has set and cultured for 45 minutes to an hour, it's been about an hour, we are going to add our rennet and I'm using half a teaspoon of rennet diluted in about one fourth a cup of cool water and I sanitize these two pieces. Um, if you don't want to sanitize everything, it's fine. It's just more of a gamble. I mostly do it um, to prevent yeast contamination because I make a lot of sourdough or bread and I don't want to get any yeast into my milk because I don't want to get any bread crumbs or anything that was against bread or had bread crumbs in it into my milk. So we're going to pour the rennet in and then we're going to use our spoon that we had resting in that sanitized container and again we're going to stir this for a full minute. So if you're using pasteurized and homogenized milk, um, this is the time where you would add your calcium chloride as well. And we're going to use that up and down motion to get the rennet mixed to the very bottom of the pot. While I'm stirring, I'm just going to turn my temperature to low for a little bit just to get keep my milk warm. This pot has a very heavy bottom and so if I get the bottom heated thoroughly I can let it set and it'll hold its temperature. I know I've talked about this before in my canning videos um, but it's true for cheese making too. You want a heavy bottom pot. Those are just your most um, effective at conducting heat. And like I said, if I get the bottom of the pot warm, it'll keep my milk warm for a good 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It'll hold its own temperature with the lid on because that pot, that bottom of the pot works a little bit like an induction. Now, for the next hour, I want my milk to stay warm around 90 degrees so it's at 88 so I'm going to keep an eye on it a little bit and bring it back up to 90 degrees over a low low burner then we can put the lid on and let it set for an hour to let the rennet set the milk okay it's been 45 minutes so we're going to check our curd for a clean break. And when we check for a clean break, I stick my finger in and that is a clean break. So we are ready to cut our curd. So when we cut our curd, we're just going to cut a grid. And I did sanitize my knife. Let's turn this light on here, see if that will show up better. We're going to cut like a one inch grid. The size of your grid doesn't matter as much as how even your grid is because that's the size of your little individual curds. And we need to get the whey out of all those curds. Um, and when they're the same size, they get ready at the same time. Like your smaller curds will be drier before your larger curds. 
So that's why, which our biggest goal is to get them the same size. So now some people cut this way still like they go at an angle, but I've never had real good luck with that. So now we're going to let it set for about five minutes and just let the curds heal and get ready for stirring. So after a couple minutes, we're going to take the temperature of, we're going to take the temperature of our curds and they're at 90 degrees. So we're going to, we're going to turn our burner to low and we are going to raise this, the temperature of the curd to 100 degrees real slowly. We want to raise it um, to 100 degrees in about half an hour. So we're just going to turn it to low and I'm going to watch that number and we're going to bring it up real slow. So as my curds heat up, I'm going to stir them to keep them from getting matted on the bottom. But first of all, I'm just going to stir them in layers to break those long cubes into curds. And I'm going to find those long curds. I'm just going to break them up. So we're just going to gently stir our curds and any that I'm going to find that are still long, I'm going to break up. And as you stir, as you gently stir the curds, they're going to release whey and the curds are going to get smaller. At this point, you want to be real gentle with the curds because you don't want to turn them to mush. You just want them to release their way. So the, the heat and the stirring is what helps your curds release their way. And that is an essential part of aged cheeses is for their way, for the, to remove the way from the curds. So as your temperature rises and as you stir, you're gonna notice that your curds start shrinking. And here's where you're gonna understand why we wanted the curds to be as close to the same size as possible because we want them all to be ready for the press at the same time. So you're just going to keep stirring over the next 30 minutes and adjust your burner so that the temperature of your whey and your curds comes up to 100 degrees. So when your 30 minutes has elapsed and you've reached 100 degrees, then you're going to pour all of your curds into a cheesecloth. So then you want to rest your curds in a warm place for an hour and I had my oven turned on warm for a little bit so it's about 80 degrees in here and I'm just gonna let them hang in the cheesecloth and I've got this pot under it to catch the whey and you're gonna let them hang here for an hour so this is all the way that drained off of the curds for cheese making and some folks um, save the whey and use it in place of milk for baking. Um, we give it to the pigs because we have lots of excess. If we keep the whey, <laughs> we'll just have a lot. Um, and when the pigs eat this, um, that helps our feed bill for today. So we're going to set that aside and the children will take that out when they come home from school 
And we're gonna get the butter started. And I have this little Allen wrench. I have to add this churn. And I hide this little Allen wrench up there in that flower pot because I have little boys in the house and they tend to make my tools disappear. So this little Allen wrench goes right up there next to the cactus where nobody will mess with it. And that way I can always find it when I need it. So I have a previous video on butter making and you will notice that I did not have this nice two gallon butter churn um, in that video. I'll link it. Um, I used to use a mixer or a blender, so you absolutely do not have to invest in a large butter churn like this right off the bat. You can wait. Um, we didn't get this until we got our jersey um, because then we had a lot of cream. Jerseys tend to give a lot of cream. So we didn't get this until maybe eight months ago, and it has definitely helped me save up more butter and get more butter in the freezer because it's such an, a hands-off way to make butter. Because when I use my blender, I would have to make it in small batches and it just kind of made a, it was a big deal. And the same with my mixer, I had to make it in small batches um, and it just took up more hands-on time. So this has definitely cut down on my, this has definitely made butter making fit into a busy schedule much easier. So while my butter churns, I am going to get my cheese press ready. So after an hour, we are going to get our cheese out of its warm place and remove it from the cheesecloth. So this is what our cheese looks like or what our curds look like after they've been hanging in a warm place where the whey can drain for an hour. So next you're going to take that nice big curd and you're just going to break it all apart. Break up all the big chunks into small chunks. So then when you've broken them all up so they're you know uniform in size, you're gonna add one tablespoon of salt. And I'm using the Redmond's Real Salt. You just wanna make sure to not use iodized salt. And then you're gonna massage that salt into the warm curds. And then you're gonna line your press your press container with your cheesecloth and you're going to transfer the salted curds into your press that you have lined with your cheesecloth. And then you're going to put in your follower. And then I'm going to put it in the press and put about 10 pounds of weight on it for 10 minutes. And I don't know how much is 10 pounds of weight. I just turn it down. I don't turn it tight. I just turn it down until the whey starts squeezing out. And all this time you want the curds to stay warm because that's how they will mesh together. Okay, so we took the press and the cheese back into my oven and I've set my timer for 10 minutes. And I'm just gonna lay this in here so that we have a better idea of how warm the internal temperature of my oven is. But I do know that it's warmer than my house. And my butter is very, very close to done. It's starting to separate. And we've got butter. Once I see butter chunks, I usually allow it to churn for a couple more minutes just to get 
It helps get all the buttermilk out of the butter. So when my timer goes and tells me that it's been 10 minutes, then it's time to take my cheese out of the press and flip it. Now, some people like to use a fresh cheesecloth every time they flip their cheese, but I don't do that. I'm just going to put it back in the same cheesecloth. So I'm going to turn it over and you can see how those curds have started knitting together with just that little bit of weight and keeping them warm. So we're just going to tuck them right back into the press. This time we want to put a little more pressure on, about 20 pounds. If you're using a weighted cheese press, use your 20 pound weight um, for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I don't have my, I don't have any weights. I really should have springs to keep consistent weight on my cheese press, but I'm just gonna turn it down a little harder than I did last time. And then I'm going to tuck it back into the oven. And I'm going to set my timer for 15 minutes this time. And after 15 minutes, I'm going to turn my weight down as hard as I can because you want to go from 20 pounds to 50 pounds of weight. And then you want to leave that 50 pound uh, weight on for the next 8 to 12 hours. And I stick a reminder on my oven over the bake button so that I remember not to turn my oven on because the cheese is in the oven. And we interrupt our day for a visit from my grandson. So I'm going to start working with my butter and I like to work with it a little bit in my butter churn while it's in the buttermilk and get it to stick together a little more so it's not in such fine clumps because it makes it easier for me to remove it. So you can let your buttermilk set on the counter um, for 12, 24, 48 hours and allow it to culture and then use it as cultured buttermilk in all of your recipes. Um, but before it's cultured, it's really just skim milk. So really, I just fold the butter over itself time and time again to squeeze out all the buttermilk. And then also I rinse it with some cold water while I'm folding it. And this helps remove all the buttermilk. If you don't remove all the buttermilk, the only thing that will happen is the buttermilk that stays in the butter will culture and make your butter taste a little sour. And it doesn't ruin it and you don't have to throw it out. It just is better for baking than fresh eating when it tastes a little sour. We like salted butter. And again, I'm using the Redmond's Real Salt, which is our favorite mineral salt and I add about half a teaspoon per pound of butter. And then I just fold that all in. So I'm going to measure out my butter and put it into 1 fourth cup increments and freeze it that way because that makes it easy for baking. But sometimes when I'm short on time, I just bulk freeze my butter and we will have to measure it out before we use it that way. And then I'm going to pop them into the refrigerator for a couple hours before I put them into a bulk container and into the freezer. So the boys are home from school and are taking all my milk discard to the pigs, my way from cheese making and the buttermilk. So those two gallons of milk that I turned into a farmhouse cheddar, after eight to 12 hours, I took them out of the press and I just let it rest on a dinner plate until it's dry. So. 
Normally, I like to use four gallons of milk and make like a four pound block of cheese just because it's more worth my time. But for the ease of the recipe, I use two gallons to show you. And this still, your cheese should feel like a clammy handshake. Um, that's how dry you want it. So I'm just gonna let this for a couple, like probably until the end of today. And then I'm gonna vacuum seal this and put it in our cheese cave. And this is a two pound wheel of farmhouse cheddar, which has, we've all decided is our favorite. So this is gonna be our staple cheese recipe. And all the other recipes I'll probably make once in a while, but this is probably going to be our go-to cheese. So today we are going to put this farmhouse cheddar into the cheese cave. Um, but first we are going to vacuum seal it with our vacuum sealer. And one day I would like to try wax sealing my cheese. Um, but for now we are using um, plastic vacuum seal bags. And as we get more confident in our cheese making, we will likely switch over to waxing our cheeses for aging. So I label my cheese. I put the date that it's put into the cheese cave and also the first date that it could possibly be aged enough to try. I put that date on as well. Headed to the cheese cave with my cheddar cheese. And when I say cheese cave, you probably imagine me going into the basement um, into an actual cheese cave. But I'm gonna show you what we're using for a cheese cave. I'm always closing doors around here, always, always. Okay, so our garage is very, very much a shared space. This is where we come in from the barn. You know, I've gotten very comfortable with you guys if I'm inviting you into this space. We share this space with the dogs. And it also doubles as my husband's shop because right now this is the only place he has for any of his tools. So this little apartment size fridge is where we keep our milk. And then up here, we've got another tiny little fridge. And this is our cheese cave. Got some feta in there. Um, this looks like it needs to be resealed. I'm gonna take that in. That's Parmesan. And I've got some Buddha case in there. Let's see what else I've got? Asiago. This is one I've been wanting to bring in. That's some red pepper Gouda. And then up here I've got some more Buddha case. And this is where we're gonna put this cheddar. And now you are probably wondering, well, I thought a refrigerator is, okay, where was the one I want to take in and seal this one? A refrigerator is too cold for aging cheese. And you are absolutely right. And that is why my husband has put this on and this overrides the refrigerator thermostat and keeps it at about 52 degrees. And I will get him to link this. But there you go, there's my cheese cave. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's video and I apologize, I did not have enough room in today's video to add the pudding or the egg custard recipe like I had planned but I will get that one posted real soon. And my cheese press, Owen made that cheese press for me and I just showed him pictures of what I wanted and he created it for me. Um, but you can buy some very nice cheese presses as well. We have had a litter of baby kittens in the barn, which is making chores more fun.
along with Sunny the calf, who is get growing and getting more spunky every day. Um, I hope to see you back here next week. And thank you, everybody, for watching.